Hello, everybody. I'm Milton Bennett, and this is CTAR Deutschland Moving Online webinar. So, this is the asynchronous version of a, an online webinar that was offered a couple of days ago, uh, but the sound quality was not very good, and so we decided to make this uh, asynchronous version which is essentially the same presentation, although we have the advantage now of being able to add uh, questions that came in uh, on the chat or uh, subsequently an email, which I will address at the end of the presentation. So uh, this is the same presentation that uh, was originally uh, presented in the, uh, in the webinar, plus uh, some response to questions that uh, occurred on email and later. So the topic uh, is paradigms, pandemics, and power. Besides being alliterative, the point of that is to try to address the issue of this uh, chaotic uh, uh, upsetness in our, uh, in our society uh, that is related to the pandemic, uh, the way in which that illustrates some, um, some uses of power and to put that all into the context of, the, of, of paradigms, I, I believe, as many of you know from my work over the last few years, that we are in the midst of a paradigm change and that part of what's going on uh, in the uh, uh, sometimes chaotic uh, social conditions that we're experiencing are the effects of this uh, paradigm change as people both try to protect the, uh, the, the trailing paradigm and also try to move aggressively into the new paradigm. I'd like to make some comments about how that relates to the issue of power, how that in turn is related to the way that we're treating the, parad the, uh, the uh, pandemic and uh, in general, what the relationship is between our intercultural work and it and the political condition in the world today. <clears throat> I'd like to um, move uh, into this idea by referencing some of these uh, texts the uh, uh, basic one, basic concepts text, of course, is the one up on the left-hand corner. Uh, the other text that I have been routinely uh, referencing uh, lately has been uh, Julian James's Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Uh, his idea, a, a very interesting one, I think, is that uh, consciousness, as we think of it in terms of self-reflexiveness, the way that we are able to see ourselves uh, in more or less uh, objective terms uh, is a relatively new phenomenon, something that uh, we've uh, only had for maybe 3,000 years, but one could say maybe it's 5,000 years, maybe it's 10,000 years, but the, the fact is a relatively short amount of time relative to our entire uh, species history. This idea is also picked up by Harari in his uh, book Sapiens, a very uh, popular treatment of this uh, large scope of uh, sapiens uh, development, where he also makes the case that the development of consciousness uh, has been a relatively recent phenomenon. And finally, uh, the invented reality, which is the piece by Paul Watzlawick, one of his last and I think one of his best collections of, of thinking, uh, in which he shows the relationship between uh, his long-term work with systems theory and the move into a more uh, constructed reality. I would say a move from relativism to constructivism. Uh, and he, I think, is a, a wonderful reference for us uh, in the communication field, along with uh, Gregory Bateson. Some other articles that may be of interest to you uh, that relate to this topic, uh, the value of cultural diversity, rhetoric, and reality, um, pretty much uh, moves through some of these paradigm arguments that I'm making. Uh, a constructivist epistemology of hate, this next one, is one where I try to pick up this idea of, of hatred and hate groups. And what does this mean uh, in, uh, in terms of, of looking, at, looking at this in, in paradigmatic terms? And finally, the article that uh, I've co-authored with uh, Castiglione on building capacity for intercultural citizenship is an attempt to apply 
these ideas uh, to uh, current notions of citizenship and uh, socio-political context. So th those uh, are all available along with other pieces on the idrinstitute.org website. The definition of paradigm that I'm using is from Thomas Kuhn, Structure of Scientific Revolution. Uh, some people say it's the most uh, referenced book in the Western world next to the Bible. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. In any case, paradigm refers to the epistemological worldview that assigns and limits acceptability of theories, concepts, models, and methods of inquiry. What that means is that a paradigm is much more than just an idea. Uh, lots of times people talk about we need a new paradigm or this is new paradigm thinking. Uh, but in many cases, that just means it's a new idea. What a paradigm does in Kuhn's terms is organize our very thinking about the nature of reality. It's so it's at a very deep epistemological level that the paradigm then facilitates our thinking about things in certain ways and makes it difficult for us to think about things in other ways. And these paradigms um, have largely moved through the traditional ones, uh, which assumedly are the way that we thought about things before we had very good documentation or even this idea of paradigm. Alter enlightenment paradigms, which are some of the earlier developments of paradigm as we moved uh, into this kind of, this new consciousness um, that uh, the the Western Enlightenment uh, uh, paradigms came, of course, later than paradigms that uh, that previously were generated in uh, an, uh, an Asian context or in an Islamic contexts, in which uh, uh, other uh, ways of incorporating consciousness uh, into the way that we understood reality were being expressed. We don't really have time to go into that in this short presentation, but it is an interesting way of looking at uh, non-Western approaches to this idea of knowledge paradigm. I'll stick with the Newtonian uh, or universalist paradigm uh, coming out of the uh, Western uh, Enlightenment tradition, uh, which I call the sirens of certainty as we uh, thought that uh, we, we could discover uh, absolute reality. The Einsteinian uh, paradigm, which supplanted that in physics and which made it clear that we could only know things from the context in which we were operating. And that as that moves into social science, it becomes what I call a whatever paradigm. But uh, I'll say some more about that. And finally, the quantum or constructivist paradigm, which is the one that takes into account the relationship of the observer to that which is being observed in such a way as to um, generate the idea of intention and the effect of intention in the way that we interact uh, with reality. Beginning with the traditional paradigm, let me treat the idea of observer, the idea then of the relationship of causality, what does that mean to the way we think things happen and why they happen, and then to the idea of power, which is essentially being able to make things happen or influence things in some way uh, or another. The traditional paradigm, according to Kuhn and Harari and others, uh, is likely to have been one in which there was no obvious observer. It is likely to be the case that people who were operating in these paradigms did not see themselves as being observers of the world, but rather they were simply participants in the world, much as other organisms uh, do their thing, whatever it is in the world, but don't, don't necessarily think about it, as far as we know. Uh, similarly, human beings are capable of doing their thing in the world without thinking about it. We still see some modern examples of that. Uh, but assumedly, there was a time when this was uh, more typical and more widespread in our species, this idea that we were just mammals engaging in our mammalian behavior, but not necessarily reflecting on that. If we were in that condition, then thinking about things would be simply a recognition of something happening, an awareness perhaps of that, but the but not the inability to to attribute causality to that. So things simply happen, uh, 
perhaps because there were some kind of unknowable forces. And eventually, of course, we had the idea that these things were uh, functions of, un, of, of supernatural forces that were generating um, the conditions uh, for one reason or another uh, for uh, events to occur. The Old Testament, for instance, of the Bible, which is clearly referring back to uh, pre-documented times uh, is is filled with these ideas that the pandemics and other kinds of plagues were visited upon people uh, generally dictated by God for uh, some reason uh, unclear to uh, to mere mortals power in this case is making things happen uh, because they are vested in supernatural forces what we've seen happen in our history, in our species history, relatively recently, are uh, kings and shamans and others who attempt to uh, connect themselves to those supernatural forces and thus to uh, acquire the power of the supernatural force. And it's been quite recently, as you know, that uh, that kings have been, uh, uh, and queens have been uh, uh, claiming divine right and uh, perhaps we're seeing a certain nostalgic return to leaders wishing that they could tap into those supernatural forces or at least be given credit for those supernatural forces. And that would be what it is that uh, gives them credibility or rationalizes uh, their power, so to speak. The uh, idea as expressed by uh, Jane's of this notion, uh, which some, some of you have seen before, but I let me just briefly review this, is his idea that initially we were not uh, able to observe ourselves, and in so doing we heard voices, we heard the voices of the gods that essentially were telling us what to do, whether they was actually coming in auditory hallucination or not is not really the important point. The important point is that we were acting without the idea of agency of our own agency. Then he suggests uh, that when we came into contact with other groups, the voices of the gods would tell us that we needed to smite them, smite them all, kill them all, and that we were treating other groups of, 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 of people uh, as we would any other threat in the environment, which is to uh, destroy them as quickly as possible. This worked okay until there were lots of groups of people. And as our population increased, it appeared to, that there were more and more of these groups and as that happened, the attempt to destroy them became increasingly dangerous to ourselves, to the existence of the species. And so as a kind of evolutionary adaptation, Jane suggests that the voices of the gods are reduced to whispers and that through language, we generate a metaphor of me. That is, we generate the idea that we are objects in the environment ourselves that we're able to reflect on. This creates the analog of I, which is the agency or the idea that if there's a me, there must be an I that can cause something, cause me to do something, uh, and thus the idea of agency. And very importantly, then the idea of theory of mind, which is that other people have that kind of agency. It's that idea that other people also have agency, which allowed us to generate a kind of co-ontogenic adaptation with others so that we were able to live without constantly trying to simply kill off uh, the other groups. And while clearly there are still examples of this kind of um, uh, genocidal um, um, hatred of others, um, uh, grotesque examples of social inequity, nevertheless, following um, uh, theoreticians like Steven Pinker, but many others as well, it's likely that we're living more peacefully with ourselves than we have any time in the past. I know it's a, it's a frightening thought to think that the current situation is probably better than any time in the past, but I suspect in terms of our intergroup relations, it probably is. Doesn't mean, of course, that we don't have a lot of things to do about that, but it does illustrate the idea that this is a relatively new uh, phenomenon, this ability for us to imagine others as having agency as we do. And uh, it's, it's fitful, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work uh, on, a, on, an, uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to that uh, here in a moment. So uh, based on this notion of the metaphor of me and being able to think of ourselves as objects, 
we saw in the Enlightenment uh, scientific revolution in the Western culture, the development of the Newtonian paradigm. This is this notion that there is a universal truth and as it reads into social science, uh, a, a kind of positivist view of trying to understand human behavior in these uh, systematic uh, scientific terms. The observer in this view is independent. There is an observer, but the observer is not really connected to events. The observer has this kind of quasi godlike view uh, of being able to see how everything is working and as a result potentially has perfect knowledge and with perfect knowledge the ability to perfectly control things. So the idea of the Newtonian paradigm was the more we know the more that we can predict and control events and this is true for physical events and also true for social events. Thus power power is vested in those people who are most deserving of this that if we are if we are able to acquire the appropriate amount of knowledge and if we are inheriting the 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 ability to recognize reality as it really is in some way or another that's what rationalizes our power and of course, a primary example of this is the hierarchy of civilizations, where the civilized people at the top are the ones who are in this uh, position of understanding reality uh, in, its, uh, in its more complete way. Below them are the barbarians who could be taught that, and we can help them to civilize. Uh, and under them, unfortunately, the savages who um, uh, probably won't be able to learn that, and therefore it's okay to exploit them. This is a kind of uh, social Darwinism, I think you all recognize, which we would like to think uh, was retired at the end of the last century when was pretty much the official end of colonialism, but uh, appears to be with us still in the name of neoliberalism. The underlying here idea is that the most dangerous idea in the world is there is one truth and I have it. This is Max Born, a physicist. Uh, and this note, this whole notion of Newtonian um, uh, ways of knowing, while it allows us to think of ourselves in objective terms, also generates this condition of the hierarchy of civilization. So as interculturalists, we need to be rather careful uh, in the way in which we use the idea of uh, of, of absolute truth. <sighs> Typically, interculturalists disavow the idea that any one culture has the absolute truth. And yet, uh, particularly in the name of social justice, we also sometimes take the idea that there is an, uh, an underlying or a priori um, a set of human rights, for instance, or other kinds of universal ethical principles which do exist across all cultures. When we make that assumption, we typically are doing so in a, in a, in a well-intentioned way, but it has the effect of supporting this paradigm and consequently of supporting this hierarchy of civilizations. We need to be doing something different than assuming that social justice will be served by pushing the ultimate truth one truth that we have. Most of us have been through the process of uh, cultural relativism, and this of course came in as a paradigm uh, largely uh, uh, suggested by Albert Einstein in physics, but as it moved into social sciences it became uh, cultural relativism and other forms of relativism that have to do with the importance of perspective, that our position uh, in the case of, uh, of physics, our position and speed is determined by our context, but in the case of uh, social situations, our, our, our position is uh, a social position, a cultural position, for instance, or some other kind of, uh, of um, uh, contextually uh, um, limited view of the world. When we have this kind of idea, we, it, it changes the notion of causality from there, it being a result of some universal principle to the idea that events are interrelated. 
darkness, of course, is the basis of all kinds of complexity theory, of uh, sophisticated systems theory, and others where we look at events as being interrelated rather than simply being um, uh, caused by some um, universal uh, principle. Power, uh, in this case, uh, must be seen in context. So rather than seeing power as coming from the universal principle, we see the power as being in somehow the control of the contextual factors within a particular context. Cultural relativism has been pretty clear, cultural relativity as the, as the anthropologists would have it, uh, has been very clear in saying that it's inappropriate for power in one context to be exercised across context into the other context. This is the basis of imperialism, colonialism, and pretty much the racism, sexism, and other kinds of uh, inequities of, of uh, social, social injustice that represent the imposition of the power of one group on another. As a principle, that's pretty good, but when we look at what's happening in the paradigm itself, what we're seeing is a shift from the hierarchy of civilization to this idea of independent uh, contexts floating around. The good thing about those independent contexts is that we can say it's not bad or good, it's just different. The unfortunate thing is that there's no good mechanism for those people to relate to one another. Um, people in culture A, for instance, might say, B, you can't understand us because you didn't grow up in A, you're not an A, you're a B. And consequently, any understanding you have of A is from B's perspective. And there's a kind of logic to that from this relativist perspective. As a result, the strong form of relativism is essentially the rejection of empathy. It's the rejection of the ability that we can understand one another um, except from our own perspective. And this, this creates a bit of a conundrum for us because on the one hand, we want to uh, have the advantage of this acceptance of, uh, of, of, of the integrity of each context. On the other hand, we would like to have some way of coordinating amongst these contexts, and, you know, or at least in the sense of getting along in some kind of reasonable way. Uh, and the mechanism is not well established for doing that. If we truly live in separate but equal worlds, the experience of the other is inaccessible and communication becomes the power to impose meaning. So, so power in this case tends to be the imposition of one group on another. We don't want to see that power operating and yet this paradigm does not really give us much of an alternative. There are some other problems that are occurring around uh, relativism despite its usefulness in thinking about uh, uh, cultural integrity. One of them is the shift from the, uh, from, from the idea of how knowledge works from the Newtonian view where facts exist objectively to this more relativist view where facts always have to exist in context. Makes sense so far, but the implication of that is in the Newtonian view, a factual dispute is about the actual truth of the matter, whereas in the relativist view, it becomes a clash of narratives. We'll come back to the idea of narrative in a moment. Uh, the, of course, the, the, the good thing about narratives are it once again establishes the integrity of context. Unfortunately, it no longer allows us to talk about truth. It only allows us to talk about one narrative versus another. Argument uh, seeks to find the best or most objective evidence as opposed to argument is appropriately the manipulation of facts, appropriately the manipulation of facts to create a more powerful narrative. And we hear that a lot, of course, in political discourse these days. News reports on the objective side try to at least be balanced, whereas news reports are inevitably subjective on the right side and as a result are either real news or fake news. I believe that this that this uh, movement from the absolutist position to the relativist position has pretty much occurred. It's pretty much uh, uh, finished, um, but it's left us in a, in a difficult position uh, that we see this war of politicized deconstructions where opposing groups agree that all views are biased, but both demand that their own view serves justice and fairness and that the other one is self-serving 
or fake. I believe that what happens here is that, that relativism, this originally very fine way of getting ourselves out of the hierarchy of civilization, has been hijacked by ideologues on all sides. And uh, we, uh, we, in fact, are in a perfect storm of, uh, of defense. And the way this works, for those of you familiar with the DMIS, uh, this is the Developmental Model of Intercultural Sensitivity, which moves from the more ethnocentric to the more ethno-relative on the right-hand side. Uh, the movement out of denial to defense has generated a fear of others. And as we come into more contact with people through immigration, through uh, globalization, through multiculturalization of our societies, we're more likely to be moving out of denial and into defense, thus generating this initial fear of uh, alterity or otherness. At the same time, minimization, which has traditionally been the way that we've addressed that through assimilation, through uh, tolerance, through recognizing uh, a kind of commonality, uh, has largely failed to keep that level of defense at bay. The, the, to some extent, it's because it's been hijacked by political correctness, where people are saying any recognition of difference is by definition biased. And, and when we make that assumption, which is an assumption that defense people make coming out of defense into minimization, they say, we can't talk about difference, otherwise it would be biased. If we continue making that assumption, it basically disallows us from moving uh, into ethno-relativism and we fall back, uh, particularly in the hands of despotic leaders who say, you really, you really should be afraid of those people who are attacking you. We fall back into defense.